Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris here with you for another week. We're doing something that just came out. Dragonlands, The Power of the Night Star. I am very, very excited to talk about this album. Uh, but before we get there, how are you, my friend? Uh, very good, very good. Uh, I think this is going to be one of those albums that uh, a lot of people are going to have on their year-end lists. And I believe uh, I speak for both of us that we are included in that as well. I have thoughts, and I will share them. Um, but to uh, to address your your statement, this album is very good, and I was very, very, very um, lucky to get a copy of it in advance. And I've been playing it nonstop for weeks. Um, I've played it probably more than any other album that's come out this year, so I think I have a pretty good grasp of it at this point. Although it's very dense, and I'm not sure that I. I'm fin- like I'm not finished listening to it. I still want to listen to it more, but I guess that's a good thing. Um, but before we talk about some Dragonland, have you seen anything new come out this week that kind of caught your ear, or kind of what have you been listening to? Yeah, uh, well, like two two singles came out today, which is kind of weird for a Wednesday. But um, I'm listening to as we speak. There's a new uh, Epica single called "The Great Tribulation," and we had talked about the Alchemy Project EP that they're releasing, and you know, with all the the guests and and this track features uh, f- uh, members of Flesh God Apocalypse, and um, I'm listening to it right now, and it sounds pretty cool. So uh, that that's one of the things I'm looking forward to uh, hearing that whole EP, and and it also it looks like um, Ronnie Atkins is releasing a EP of uh, or- orchestra versions of some of the tracks from his last album, and so that EP is going to be called uh, Symphomaniac, and uh, they. Um, he released "Let Love Lead the Way," the orchestra version uh, today. So um, those are just two uh, two tracks. I think um, I, re- I just I mentioned like a hundred things last week, so I think that pretty much covers us this week too. I, I have a pair of things myself. Um, always, he- first of all, happy to hear about some new music from Ronnie. I know we seem to say that all the time because he's been just releasing stuff like crazy, but. Every time he's doing something, I'm interested. And it's often interesting to hear different versions of songs that you're already familiar with. So that should be cool. But um, there's a band that I just, that kind of came on my radar a couple of months ago. I had been sent a, a pre-release for this band. They're called After Lapse. It's a Spanish prog metal band, but they pride themselves on being on more of the melodic side. So Immediately, the antennas go up, and I think about you because that's the way you like your prog. Um, But After Lapse, the album is called uh, Face the Storm, and they released a single called Come Undone, and I'm very happy that this is finally getting some um, attention. Ironically, they're on Frontiers, and although they don't sound like a typical Frontiers band, they're melodic and catchy enough that even though they're a prog band, I think it fits on the label. So I I definitely recommend checking that out. I'll, I'll post it this week. And another band that has just gotten better and better and better with time, Borealis out of Canada. Um, I remember when their first album was released, and I really didn't care for it so much, but every single album that's come out has gotten better and better. And and the new one, um, Illusions, is no exception. This album is really good, and it's like kind of like a more melodic, more polished, slightly more power metal version of Evergrey. Really, really well done. Um, have you had a chance to listen to that yet, or or not so much? I, you know what, I I found out that it came out and I bought it, and then but I haven't listened to it yet. But it is in it is in the ever growing queue of things um, that never seems to stop growing. Uh, so, um, but it, I, you're not the first person I've heard that had um, had high praise for this. So, and, and their last album, I um, enjoyed quite a bit. Um, I remember that being, I think the first time I really listened to one of their albums start to finish and I was impressed with it. So, uh, the last man, one I remember, do, do you remember the when last... they played at, at Prague power? It was, they were like on the Thursday night showcase back when they weren't really as, uh, well known back then. This was like, mm-hmm. I think that was the year like primal fear played They They headlined like Thursday night and I, this is a while ago. I might have to. I have to check my research and make sure that information is accurate, but 
what 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 is accurate is that they did play and that it was a while ago and their evolution has been nothing short of amazing i'm not saying that they weren't good at the time but they're now great and and this album kind of picks up where the last one left off just high quality production really really melodic catchy songs but they have the technical chops to kind of pull the whole thing off um their their ascension has really kind of gone way up and and they've skyrocketed at least for me in terms of just the whole package i am really really um excited about this album i I think they did a great job with it i am dying to see them again because i think they just improved dramatically as a band yeah so i'm looking now it was 2010 and they were um they opened uh they played with um leprous and accept which uh we were at a Braves game, so we, we missed. We did not see them. Uh, yeah, yeah. I do, I do remember that they had played at Prague Power, and uh, uh, Six Minute Century was the opening band that night. So um, I can't believe this was a, de- a dozen years ago. That's that's yeah. More so the, insane. this was um, this was the first time that um, this is the first that's that was the first year that we had attended the Wednesday night show. Uh, uh, cause we, I think I was actually the one who kind of pushed for it cause I wanted to see Van Gogh and seven kingdoms and, and Ross, the boss. And that, I thought that was like a, a neat little three band bill for, uh, the, in the loft. So that was kind of our first foray into the, the Wednesday night, uh, shenanigans. And then I remember the Thursday night we, um, we went to the the Braves game and sat alone in an entire section. So they weren't very good in 2010. They've improved a lot since then. Although tonight looks like it could be another tough game. But I, I digress. I digress. Um, you know, it's funny. We uh, we talk about a lot of those Prog Power shows. That one in particular, it seems like ages ago. I mean, just absolutely like another lifetime it's well 12 years is a while <laughs> yeah no, no question but uh good album highly recommended definitely uh, recommend everyone checking it out and i'll try to post a song this week but now we come full circle to another band that played prog power uh but have been twice on a in the same twice yeah. in the same four days well, you know what why don't we talk a little bit about that before we even get into this album um dragon land has been around for two decades but it feels like they've been non-existent or dormant for the last 10 years, not including that Prog Power show. Yeah, um, mostly because they haven't released an album in 11 years. It, it, right. This was a, a long, long stretch since uh, Under the Grey Banner came out. And, and prior to that, it had been five years since Astronomy. Um, prior to that, they kind of were releasing albums as fairly regular regularly um but uh, i'm guessing um i'm guessing olaf uh having amaranth which i imagine is a band that that's very active as far as touring and stuff probably has something to do with it but i think like all the members probably have i know uh jonas had i think he told me he was in the last time i talked to him i think he told me he was in like four bands and (laughs) so like i'm guessing they all have their own yeah, they all have their own things going on, and I'm sure, like, to get everybody on the same page at the same time, uh, especially to put together something that's, like, this dense and this epic, probably, uh, probably, I know they've been working on it for a while, I'll just say that. Yeah, um, it's it, it, it's interesting. I, what year was it that they played Prog Power? Do you remember? I feel like it was... Uh... I can look that up too. I remember that because that was the, the I remember that was the snake bit year where yes, like there were so many so many uh visa issues and um Dragonland was um they were already going to be they were already gonna be there to play on the Thursday night show. Um and there was a uh there was a, a band fell out. Um who was it that Dynasty. um yes that's right um there were too well a, a couple of the a couple of the band members were there uh but then a couple of other band members were detained and not able to come over and so kind of at the last minute um also that uh i believe um unleash the archers were a replacement of uh, a couple of months before the festival um Seven i believe Spires. Nita- 
I think wound up being a replacement like two days before the show and stuff like that because there were that many casualties. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Native Construct was a replacement for um, whoever was the original opener. Um, Falconer and Anathema flipped spots uh, to so that Anathema could kind of make it to their next show a little bit earlier. Um, it's kind of crazy when you think about like how many lineup changes there were um, because this was one of the most memorable years that I remember um, just band wise. Like there was, you know, Soto was a replacement for, um, I don't remember, um, but his set was really memorable. Voyager had a, a, a set, a fan chosen set list. That was amazing. Falconer played their last show ever. Unleash the Archers were there. Dragonland played two sets. Riverside uh, did a great set. And then Royal Hunt and Angra finished off playing Paradox and Holy Land. Um, That's, and that was uh, just fr- and that was just Friday and Saturday. I mean, uh, the the Thursday night show had had Alma, Dragonland, Armored Saint, and Saxon, and uh, and the Wednesday night show had um, Voyager playing all of I Am the Revolution, Evergrey headlining, and then with the uh, Ashes of Ares and uh, Halcyon Way. Um, it's a f- opening solid up. lineup when you put it yeah, all together. I mean, when you think about how many bands j- got dropped out. Um, I believe uh, Hibria was supposed to play that weekend. Uh, right. They that um, that didn't work out. I mean, it was there was just a lot of uh, a lot of casualties of war, if you will. But um, it, it ended up being a, a lot of fun at, at the end of the day. No, no doubt about it. And their set, its sets plural in particular, were just phenomenal. I just remember being blown away by their live show. And I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but the albums are so intricate and so dense and so heavily orchestrated that I just had concerns about seeing that in a live setting, but they did not disappoint. Um, and I am just a sucker for some of those older albums. So when, when they announced that they were kind of getting back together and that they were having this new album come out, I, I remember being, I don't want to say concerned, but thinking to myself, there's no way they're going to be able to do something as good as the old stuff, right? To me, I, I always thought Astronomy was their best album. Uh, I know a lot of people would argue that um, Under the Great Banner was their best album, and some fans even prefer the the first two albums. But for me, it was I was always an Astronomy guy, and I was curious to see how this would hold up with so many bands kind of coming back into the picture. And I, I know I think I've referenced this in the past. I am a huge Porcupine Tree fan, but their new album was not as good as some of the material that they had released 15 years ago. In my opinion, I I know other people will differ. I think it was a strong album, but I don't think it was a special album. Um, I had had reservations about this. Did you have high expectations for this or was this kind of – did you just kind of take it in stride and said, let's just see what this is? No, I had had high expectations. And and I think the – the time, the amount of time that it's been since Under the Gray Banner came out is part, a big part of that. Like when a band doesn't release an album for 11 years and, 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 you know, their, their last two albums, like you said, this were especially strong albums. Um, and one of the things about this band that I always found fascinating is that, you know, you had said to me a long time ago, you're like, this is, this band is like your, you know, your cup of tea, hundred percent all the way. And I always, I struggled with them for a while because for a power metal band, like you said, you mentioned before dense, like their, their material really is so, there's so many layers and there's so much going on. It, it took me a lot of listens and it was, uh, it was anticipating the, those, you know, not that I knew they were going to play twice, but it was anticipating those sets of prog power that I really, really like, started concentrating and listening to all their stuff and i i fell in love and they became one of my favorite bands and and so like this album was something i was very much looking forward to and i'll i'll say this it didn't i don't want to say disappoint that's the wrong word but this album is every bit as dense as their other material i'd argue even denser and even though i've listened to it a ton I still feel like there's, I hear new things every time I hear it and I pick up on different nuances. 
And that's not a bad thing. It actually keeps me interested because the melodies are still there to kind of drive the ship or, or steer the ship, if you will. Um, this was a really, really interesting release. And, and that's kind of why I wanted to talk about it. That and, of course, I think that we were due for an episode on these guys. I think I'll just kind of introduce the band and kind of set the stage a little bit. Um, Jonas Heigert on vocals, kind of his band. He's been in it since the beginning. Uh, Olaf Mork on lead guitar. Jesse Linskog on lead guitar. Elias Homeland on keyboards and, and synthesizer and piano. And he plays such a, an important role in this band. I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, Johan Nunez on drums and Anders Hammer on bass. These six guys have been pretty much in the band for the bulk of 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 their releases although johan i think is new on bass i don't recall i think he played live in atlanta if i'm not mistaken but i don't think he was on the last album um but the 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 sound that these six guys get to to kind of come out on on these albums not to mention the fact that that it's a 65 minute album i mean this is not a short release um very very impressive Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> I'm. I'm just kind of like uh, going over the their credentials right here. I'm trying to see, um, you know, where uh, where some of these guys, what other bands they they might have been in, and and it looks like um, looks like um, Johan uh, replaced uh, Morton Sorensen of, of Amaranth, who was the uh, the drummer for Dragonland for a good bit. So kind of had that that Amaranth Swedish connection, and I know. Um, Elise has done some guest vocals for Dragonland, possibly even prior to Amaranth's uh, first album. I- I'm not sure. I would have to double check on that, but that might have been one of her earlier uh, appearances on a, on a metal album. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no question. And I, I, I mean, ultimately, I'll kind of lay it out there now. I'm curious to get your thoughts at the end. I'm curious to see where this album although it's obviously fresh in our minds, kind of lands for you in terms of their overall discography. Is it your favorite album? Is it one of your favorites? Is it towards the bottom? And I, and I only ask the question because I have thoughts about that, but I'll, I'll kind of save them to the end. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sure we will, uh, we'll talk about that at the end for sure. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to even be able to answer it yet. Like I've listened to this album five times and I feel like I haven't even really scratched the surface. Yeah. Like, I, it, like by comparison, like the new Stradivarius album, I listened to, I think la- like maybe three times and I feel like I know it better than this one. And, and I agree. so it's, it's weird. Um, but by the same token, so, there's something good there because e- I enjoyed every one of the listens, whereas obviously the Stradivarius album is great and it's one of the better albums, I think, in 2022. But it's just, I don't want to say more accessible, but it just stays with you, I guess, and, and you kind of remember it because it's a little more straightforward and stuff like that. Whereas this, there's it, there's intricacies on each one of these tracks, which I don't even think will do it justice because – I'll be honest. I mean, we, we, we've listened to it, you know, quite a few times, but I feel like if you, if I was to cover this a year from now, after I continued to listen to it, I might have more, I may pick up on some of these nuances that I'll probably gloss right over because I didn't catch them despite listening to it nonstop for the last month. Yeah. Well, I think we'll both have more to say about it come the end of the year when we do our uh, year end episode. I think it's, I don't think we're not spoiling anything by saying that this album is going to be on both of our lists more than likely. So yeah, uh, I, I think the only question really is how high um, for for reasons I'll get to. But let's let's kind of jump in on this thing. Um, as I said, this 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 is this is a good one. But the the album clocks in at just like I said about sixty six minutes. It opens with a track called "The Awakening." This is, in my opinion, kind of like your two minute intro. Very very heavy symphonic. And, and you're kind of fairly typical. Uh, easily the track. easily the worst song on the album. I would agree with that. <laughs> I mean, because it, it just, I mean, I don't think there's anything particularly special about it. It's the kind of thing that most bands are doing, but it's, it, it provides a nice backdrop to the, to the first real track, a light in the dark. Every one of these tracks probably has what I'm about to say about light in the dark. And that's an amazing keyboard solo. And that, and then here it just kind of opens with it. And then the vocals automatically, once they kick in, it 
kind of helps drive the song in many ways more than the guitars. I mean, not that Olaf isn't great and not that um, the, the, you know, I, I guess not that um, Jesse doesn't do a good job on a lot of the leads, but to me, this, this is very much keyboard driven power metal and a song like this, which is kind of mid paced is like the perfect table setter for this. And I, I think it's a fantastic opening track. Yeah. It's um, to me, like, uh, as soon as the track starts, you're like, "This is Dragonland." You just it has that vibe, like that you you just know who it is. Um, it has a it has a, a familiarity to it while remaining original. Um, and uh, like like you said, just a great way to kind of kick things off. Um, I love I love Jonas's vocals so much, and I'm not just saying that because he's gonna be a guest of ours on our next episode. But like, um, I think that he, he has such a unique sound and and like, you just know it's him right away. I get, I get a kick out of whenever he does like guests, guest spots on like, um, there's that, uh, Marius Danielson's, uh, legend of Valley doom series and stuff. And so like, anytime I hear, uh, Jonas pop, pop up somewhere, it's, uh, it's always a, a, a pleasure, but, um, yeah, like you said, like this is a very keyboard driven song. Um I, I think it's a great way to like you said, great way to to, to kind of kick things off and um it really uh I think it kind of makes for like uh it's like the, the you know, Dragonland returns after eleven years and this is like the first uh full full length track that we've heard from this band in a long time, if you don't count the the singles that came out prior. Um, you know. Uh, this is a, a hell of a way to to kick back in. Yeah, and you mentioned Jonas's vocals. I love how they progressively get higher and higher in terms of the octave as we go through this track. Um, I thought that was a nice touch, and you know, I, I think that he's got the luxury of being able to sing at a normal range, and then obviously being able to sing those high notes, which are just incredible. Um, but it's being able to do both in the same song, which really kind of, I don't know. I, I, to me, it's a win. And and then you kind of you set the table with that track, but then you go into the next track, which is Flight from Destruction. And this is a real banger of a tune. This is really fast. Um, this is a fantastic song. I, I could have easily chosen any of these songs as my song of the week. Uh, I'm not choosing this one, but the intro gets it moving right away. Very, very crunchy guitars. And for the first time, the drums are really a big factor here as well, because it's kind of like the antithesis of the first tune because it's just kind of like a runaway train in terms of the speed. Uh, I thought this was an excellent choice for a single and I'm glad they released it because it checks off all the typical power metal boxes, but with the dragon land flair to it. Um, and, and even on this track, the bridge was a real standout, which it kind of slows down and then it gets a touch faster, faster. And then he gets into those fast courses at the end where it just picks up speed again, just a phenomenal constructed track. I love it. Yeah, this was, um, I think this was the second single that they released after um, the the title track, and uh, whew, yeah, this is uh, this is where like uh, my uh, my my power metal blood starts to get get boiling because um, this is just like exactly what um, exactly what I love about this band and and just power metal in general, and yeah, like you said, the uh, the bridge and the chorus are just super catchy, like just. Uh, really awesome tune um just good stuff uh, it, it's it was kind of the first time i listened to the album it was kind of like um it was kind of cool to hear that one that first song that i actually recognized from the single yeah, so i was like yeah. oh yeah there you go uh, like good yeah it's like good stuff like band has hit uh hit is two for two so far um because these are two really good really good tunes and this is uh yeah this was one of my one of my favorites um probably because I was familiar with it going in, but um, uh, it hasn't, uh, hasn't lost its luster. Talk, talk a little bit about um, Through Galaxies Endless, uh, the next track. This one, obviously, a touch slower, almost almost like a power ballad. I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, but, like, keys, man. Like, give, yeah. me, give, me, give me keys. I, I, you know me. Like, uh, my love for Power Quest has never been... Uh, never been something I've shied from. And, uh, you know, this, this kind of gives me that, that kind of vibe where you have these big sweeping, um, 
you know, key, uh, keyboard chords and, and orchestrations to kind of kick things off. And, and, you know, like you said, once again, we're kind of back to a, um, a slower, a slower paced song after the last song was just a real, like, like you said, like a real banger. Um, this is another, but like, you know, we talk about like, um, you know, bands that, that excel at, at doing like all of the different, you know, tempos and styles and Dragonlands, one of those bands where to me, when they do a mid tempo song like this, it's still awesome. Like it, I wouldn't want them to release an album full of, uh, flight from destructions, you know, like it's th- th- these kind of slowdowns are, are exactly the kind of pacing that makes a Dragonland album so enjoyable. Um, yeah, you know, like it- like that, like I think of like that's the song Supernova. It's one of my all time favorite songs by any band, and that's not a Dragonland like super fast song. It's actually more of a mid tempo song. But my God, that song is incredible. I get goosebumps every time I hear it. Oh yeah, I, I completely agree, and I think it's. I think it's a testament to them that they can make a 66 minute album and not feel like any song uh, is the same as the one, you know, prior to it. It, it, it definitely, there's ebbs and flows here. And I think that that's a, a, a kind of a really good thing. This, this track is, and that's actually one of the things I was going to say that what I love so far is the pacing of this album, where you go from kind of mid pace to a real banger to almost like a ball- power ballad in many sense um, this is going to be one of those songs which I feel like the crowd is going to just eat up live and they're going to sway side to side and sing along um, to the chorus. This is a really good tune as well. I, I think I'm becoming a little bit of a broken record as I say that, but I do love how each of those first three main tracks sound nothing like each other. And I think that that is um, what helps keep driving this train down the tracks. Yeah. And and this, uh, this is also like the chorus has those, um, they kind of layer, Jonas's vocals to so it almost sounds like there's a chorus singing and yeah. and like you said I think that's going to be like that spot where the crowd is going to sing along it, it it just fits for that kind of uh environment so so perfectly so um yeah just uh I mean I I don't know about you I don't really I don't have any real negative thoughts about any of the songs on this album so No uh, so no so but I'll, I'll say this the, the one of the tracks that took me a little bit longer to come around to, but ironically enough, was the next one. It's called The Scattering of Darkness. It clocks in at about five and a half minutes. And to me, it was a bit of a slow starter, but you kind of knew it was going to pick up and it does pick up. But I, I remember the first couple of listens before I knew what was going to happen. It was a bit jarring to me. Um the pre-chorus has that gallop that we always talk about, the metal exchange gallop. And then all of a sudden the chorus kicks in and it is a monster chorus. Not my favorite track on the album, but certainly deserves to be there. Um, and and it, a, a kind of a song with a more of an epic feel to it, I think. Yeah, this was the third of the three singles to be uh, dropped before the album, the album's release. And um, man, I, I ended up really liking the song. I, the last time I listened to the album, I was in the car and, and it, when it came on, I was just like, yeah, yeah, I like the way that it kind of starts out a little bit kind of um yeah i guess it's like overall it's it's kind of a, a more a mid mid tempo kind of song but like it, it like you said like the with the the choruses and everything it just feels really really epic and again it's just like like we said before there's just like so much density to these tracks there's they they, they cram so much into a, a five to six minute song. It's really impressive. Like, I, I don't think that there's a lot of, uh, I don't think there's a lot of like modern day power metal bands that do, do like justice to the, to the genre, the way Dragonland does in such a, a unique and, and, and like uh, just a, a trademark sort of way that they, that feels like it's theirs and not like a rip off of something else, you know? Yeah, and I like I I've I've said this a number of times. I've become more and more disenchanted with power metal. It's just I don't know. I feel like maybe it's because it it's nostalgia talking, or maybe it's because I truly believe that we kind of hit the heyday in the late '90s and early 2000s. But here we are, 20 years later, and I think that this one is easily one of the top three power metal albums that I've heard this year. I want to say it's the best. I actually like it more than the Shred of Arius, and I thought that that was a very strong release. Although I don't think that that is exactly power metal. I think it's 
they've kind of drifted away from that. But this, in terms of just quintessential power metal, I think this and Fellowship are the two albums to beat. And I prefer this a lot to the, to Fellowship. I thought that was a very good release. I think this is an excellent release. Um, and and what, maybe part of the reason is is like stuff like the next track, um, A Threat from Beyond the Shadows. This one is darker and proggier in many spots. And I think that the prog in me loves this track as a result. You've got the double bass drum in full effect. Spoken word part took me out of it a little bit, but I, I, I can see how it kind of advances the story, which I'm still trying to figure out. Um, but I think it's a good place to notice or note that this, this album, unlike their prior albums, has more of like a futuristic feel to it. It's not like um, Dungeons and Dragons going back into the, you know, into the Renaissance era. This really has more of a futuristic vibe to it and almost like, um, I don't know, I thought that was a nice touch. And, and this particular track has like a Final Fantasy seven feel to it where at some point in the future and then all of a sudden out of nowhere there's growls which was like a really nice touch that i wasn't expecting to hear um this is a phenomenal tune and and probably one of my favorites on the album do you know who um who's doing the guest vocals on this song because i i was i don't know there's yeah because there's because there's clean vocals that are not jonas and there's uh, growls that i'm fairly certain are not Jonas either um but uh this is another song I really enjoyed quite a bit as well I I don't know that I have much to add beyond what you already said but um good stuff um just you know all the all the instruments are just uh, like kicking in high gear like the drums are awesome like it's I I feel like I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot but um I I just think that this is uh, another really good another really good tune to to break up the density that is this album, they were smart and they kind of put this little interlude track, Aphelion, next, which was kind of a filler track in my opinion, but it was really good for the pacing of the album. So it was a way to just kind of break up, we'll call it side A and side B. Well done, even though I have nothing else to say about that particular track. Anything to add or you want to just get into Celestial Squadron? No, it's it's just I think like you said it's kind of like um giving the listener a breather cuz I mean it, it it's been, you know, uh five five really like dense heavy songs in a row um all you know either fast paced or medium paced but all really heavy and all really dense and and so this kind of uh it, it almost kind of is like your um your outro to to part 1 and intro to to part two, I guess. And, and yeah, exactly. Celestial, Celestial, Celestial Squadron is right back to, you know, I hope you enjoyed your two and a half minute break because uh, <laughs> your b- break time's over. Yeah, I, I have a feeling you would like this track. Um, what what about it kind of stood out to you? Oh, the, the um, again, like those those layered vocals, like that like epic chorus that just, sc- you know, screams uh, power metal concert, sing along. Um, just, uh, it it just really good stuff. Um, kind of, uh, it it, it kind of harkens back to like the, the, the Rhapsody heyday back when they were at the top of their game and, and were one, one band. Um, just, uh, yeah, just like, just killer, like killer orchestrations. Great, great, uh, great like you know those those again the layered choruses just uh you know a, another um really strong just another like one of those mid tempo dragonland songs that just kicks ass like it, it's just it's like i i, I don't know any power metal band that will that can write like a mid tempo song like this and and have it be so so good like it, it's like you do the the slow mid tempo headbang and you're still like you're still rocking you're still rocking out but at the same time it's like it's not you know a, like a blazing fast eagle fly free type of song the the whole album is unmistakably dragonland but this track maybe more than all the others has that vintage Dragonland feel to it, almost like a callback to some of the older albums in a way. Um, I love the solos on this. I think the dueling guitar and keyboard solos are, are fantastic. And I just thought it was like a well, well put together 
I, I kind of use the word like meticulously crafted song. I think it's just, I think it's really, really good. And it goes into another track where there's no let up at all with, it's called resurrecting an ancient technology. Um, as we get deeper and deeper into this album, I think it was at this point where I said to myself, this is a special album because I have, I have nothing totally negative to say about any of this stuff. I mean, I can nitpick, but this, this track, um, something about it was really, really, um, interesting because, and I could be mishearing this, some of the vocal lines in this particular, particular song sounded almost like it was, they were hearkening back to some of the verses and choruses earlier on the album. Maybe I'm just hearing things that aren't there. Um, I don't even know if it was intentional, but it was something I noticed. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a standout track, but it's a very solid tune. And what I love is the symphonic elements specifically on this track blow away what 98% of the other bands are doing when it comes to adding those symphonic elements to their songs. Yeah. Not, and then not to mention just the, the hooks that this band has that just make everything so memorable. And, you know, going back to like talking about uh, Jonas's vocals, this is one of those songs where he starts out and it's almost like he's doing like the, the Jonas whisper, like he's almost <laughs> singing it a whisper and it's like, it's almost like he's lulling you into this like false sense of security <laughs> before he blows your socks off with these like killer soaring high pitched vocals. It, but I love when he does that kind of uh, it, it's like um, in a lower register and it's just almost like a quiet, it's a quiet singing. Um, yeah. He, yeah. His, his range is incredible. And, and can we talk about the production for a second? The production on these albums, this one in particular are so good and so um, crystal clear, especially given all that's happening, dual guitars, the keyboards, the orchestration, and yet you can easily identify each and every instrument. Uh, and, and quite frankly, the drums and the bass are never overshadowed on any of these tracks. Uh, c couldn't agree more. It, it's, it's just a sonically, uh, very pleasant experience. Uh, I, I I, the, 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 the getting to listen to the whole thing, driving in my car, just like at, at full blast, like it just sounded so good. I was, it, it kind of sucked me into it even more so than just the usual have it on in the background while working, you know, sort of deal, like where you could really concentrate on, on what's going on and really uh, just, just drink it in, I guess, to quote yeah. Chris Jericho. Drink it in my friend. Uh, let's talk, <laughs> let's talk about the title track because, um, in my opinion, this is like flower power metal at its absolute finest. Um, I, I hear like a freedom call vibe to it just because it, it's one of those tracks that kind of just puts you in a good mood, puts a smile on your face and everything from the opening vocal lines until when the guitars actually kick in, it's just like, put a smile on your face, sit back and enjoy the ride a touch formulaic on this one. I don't think that there's anything new. They're not reinventing the wheel, but it's so well done that you have to like it. And arguably, arguably the best chorus on the entire album. Arguably. Yeah. I've, I've found this chorus to be stuck in my head repeatedly since June when it came out, <laughs> this was the first single. And I remember the first time I listened to it was on the flight back from Atlanta and I listened really? to it like three. I listened to it three times on the plane, including uh, right as the plane was about to land, and then the pilot decided that he didn't want to land the plane anymore because of the rain. So he circled the runway, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to put on some Dragon Land and pretend this isn't happening. <laughs> so uh, did it work? Uh, yeah, but now Run every time down. I listen to this song, I picture a plane not landing. So. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's a double-edged sword, I guess. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this my song of the week for no other reason than it's the song that I've been aware of the longest. Because um, th this th this album to me is like one giant tie for song of the week. That it just every song is is memorable in its own cool way. Um, this is just the one that's been with me the longest, so I'm just gonna go with it. So uh, let's give it a let's give it a listen. This is uh, the title track, "Power of the Night Star."
I I can easily see why you chose this as your song of the week. And I'll be honest, I haven't selected one yet. I At different points, I think I've had about five or six different songs chosen. And then I listened to the album again. I wound up choosing a different song. <laughs> I don't know if that's a testament to the fact that not that there's not really a standout track or if it's just because all the songs are so good that I find myself oscillating between all of them. Um, but definitely a, a good choice. Um, it goes into one of the tracks that I adore. And you know what? I'll make it my song of the week. It's called Final Hour. This song is heavy. This song is fast. It has a bit of grit to it. And it definitely feels climactic in a number of ways. It's one of those songs where you want to get your blaster and just start going to battle on on, on the ship or what have you. Uh, another one that I think will be great live. I love how it kind of in the middle of this in the middle of this banger. There's like these whimsical sections that kind of just take it down a little bit, and then bam, it breaks up the the, the sonic assault that that is the rest of this song. Um, Really, really cool track. And and also it harkens back to my love for astronomy because there's female vocals on this track as well. And I think it really stands out. And I, I think it's that ode to, to that album that I love that I, I feel like I have to pick this one. Um, definitely want to hear your thoughts, but let's let's give this a quick listen. Before I, I hear your thoughts, I just want to make one other note about this track. I don't know what like keyboard patches are being used here, but the way that the keyboards and the and the patches that are being used kind of accentuate the guitars on this track, it, it's absolutely superb. Was that something that you noticed, or or did you kind of pick up on other things in this tune? Uh, I, I mean, uh, to me, like they kind of, I, I, they, I wonder if they're just a, their own original patches because they, I feel like nobody else does like that same sound the way Dragonland does. Um, I, 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 I'm gonna mirror your sentiments. The song comes in like a, like a, you know, a, a truck flying through, and and uh, the thing I like about the song and really this album on a whole is that it. Let you you kind of mentioned it before it it has that it has that kind of like medieval construct but yet it's done in kind of a futuristic way it, it kind of reminds me of what glory hammer did where they went from like their first album was like a medieval based album and then they went like right into the future but yep. yet still maintain kind of the signature sound and i feel like um dragonland definitely is doing that this is more like um you know, more in the, the vibe of astronomy where it's more about, um, more about space and, and, and the future and things like that than, than medieval times, but they do both so well, but this still, this song especially just has kind of the, um, the vibe of the song sounds like it has that, that power, that kind of, uh, medieval power metal kind of vibe, but yet done in like this kind of keyboardy futuristic kind of way. So, um, I, I I think this is this song is as good as any to to choose as the song of the week. So uh, one of my one of my favorites, and, and to follow the last song with a song that's just as good. I mean, you know. and this is side B of the album, which for many people is usually the weaker side of the two albums, or, you know, of an album or something like that. But two fantastic songs back to back, and I got to be honest, I almost chose Journey's End, which is like the epic tune on the album. Um, this track clocks in at nine minutes in about 15 seconds. So it's just shy of 10 minutes, um, has a darker feel than a lot of the other tracks. 
at least for my money. But again, the dual vocal lines, which you've brought up a couple of times, they are on this track in full display, and it gives it this really um, bombastic feel. I, I think it's really, really interesting. It, the, the way they do it, um, unlike other bands, there's like kind of lots of starts and stops on this one, but it doesn't drag, and you kind of just... It's like you're in the roller coaster and you just don't know where it's going to go next. Almost maybe like it's in the dark or something like that. It's a very engaging tune and you can just see that they kind of want you to come along for the ride. And then the one knock I'll say is that there's an outro to this tune, which for my money could have just ended the album. I find the next track as good as it is to be a little bit jarring after Journey's End. I almost wonder why they didn't conclude the album there. I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, usually the that long epic track kind of uh, is how, you know, especially in po- power metal, you know, think about Keeper Part 2 or Symphony of Enchanted Lands. It's just like you want to have that epic ending. But um, uh, they weren't done, and I wasn't sad that they weren't done. You know, it's uh, – it's this is um, – it has kind of um, – eh, ballady is not the right word, but it's almost like this very um, – it kind of has like this epic finale, epic fin- uh, finality is actually the word I'm looking for to, to this album that I think um, Journey's End didn't quite feel like a last song, whereas this really feels like they're kind of like, you know, the the um, the, the vocals are kind of like drawn out and it's kind of like, all right, and we're coming to an end here and we're wrapping things up and, you know, hope you're, you know, hope you find your face after it melted off for 66 minutes. And to their credit, the track is called Oblivion. What they did do is they kind of ended the album with a piano outro, which I guess was a really good idea because if you're not going to end with Journey's End, it, there, there does feel like there's a bit of finality here. Um, some of the guitar playing I thought was really emotional on this track and, and the drumming kind of keeps it all together. This is a really good song as well. I just it was like I said, it was the outro to Journey's End that kind of made it a little bit jarring, but in its own right, a very, very good song. And Oblivion is a good way to end the album um, in it, on its own, on its own, in a, you know, in and of itself. You know, with all the albums that come out on a year-to-year basis, I don't know that we listen to a lot of things as much as we want, but this thing has been in rotation for me for so long. I don't see that changing between now and the end of the year. I just find myself going back to this a lot. Yeah, same here. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know where it's going to land for me at the end of the year, but it's probably going to be um, pretty pretty high up the list. Um, it should be mentioned. I, I haven't heard it yet, but um, the Japanese version has a bonus track of a uh, Aha cover of uh, "The Sun Always Shines on TV," which I'd be honest with you, I wouldn't know the song if it wasn't for Lord. Uh, covering it on um, one of their uh, recent EPs, and that's kind of the uh, only reason I'm aware of it. I believe they literally it literally follows a cover of uh, "Someone's Crying" by Halloween. So Halloween into Aha, it's a natural <laughs> natural progression of things. But um, Dragonland does have um, some fun uh, cover tunes through the years. I, I think back to their cover of the the theme song from the Never Ending Story, which they played at prog power which i was like that's amazing that they just busted this out live um i have to get my hands on that i'm curious to hear it yeah same here um yeah that's on the the japanese uh the japanese version so um yeah i I feel like i I was a little uh tongue-tied talking about this album because i just think it's i i still don't have it um in my in my brain as, as, as well as I'd like to. And I just think just because like you said, and we've been harping on it from the start, it really is a very dense uh, album and just, uh, but I will say like from the first time I listened to it to the last, it has been just a a very enjoyable listen. and, And it's, it's gotten a little bit better each time I've listened to it. Are you, able to articulate where it falls for you in terms of the rest of the discography or are you not there yet honestly i i haven't listened to their other albums in so long um that it's i'm not really i don't know if i could really say but i have a feeling that when it's all said and done this is probably going to be at the very least a a top three dragon land album for me i i will say this i think that the highs of astronomy 
songs like Cassiopeia um, and Supernova, I think those songs are maybe the best songs that they've done in their career. But top to bottom, this could be their best album if it continues to have that staying power because there's no bad songs. Not that not that Astronomy had any bad songs, but here I would say that every song is between like a B plus and an A minus, whereas Astronomy had a lot of songs that were A or A plus and a couple of Bs on there, which were good songs, but not great. Whereas, you know, top to bottom, I thought this was a little bit more of a steady release. Um, I'm going to give it an 8.75. And I got to be honest with you, with more time, it may be pro- approaching a nine territory, which this year would be up there for album of the year, because I don't know that I can say that about many releases. Um, I was blown away by this and I continue to just immerse myself in this day after day. And I, like I said, I haven't been able to say that about most releases this year. Um, scale of one to 10, what are you giving this? Uh, I think it's, it's been a while that, that, that we've landed on the exact same number, but, um, or maybe it hasn't been, I think we both gave uh paradox a 10. <laughs> so, uh, it's been a while since we both didn't get, both gave an album the same rate rating. That wasn't a 10, I guess. Um, yeah, that I'm right there with you. 8.75, but, uh, I mean, this, this might be a 9.5 for me by the end of the year. I, I just, um, it, it's almost like a, uh, like the review is still in, in, in progress for me. <laughs> I'm with you. And I look forward to kind of picking Jonas's brain um, in our next episode because there's I have questions and I want them answered. And I didn't want to just kind of hypothesize here, but I, I'm curious to see based on, you know, you know, his insight, why they did certain things, why they didn't do other certain things and whether things were just intentional or, you know, meticulously placed. Really good stuff. Uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about it again in the near future and then towards uh, the end of the year. Of little doubt, um, I, I uh, peek behind the curtain. You're coming down here so that we can go watch a bunch of shows next week. So we wanted to get this episode kind of recorded a little bit ahead of time. Not many news items for, on my end. I just would be remiss not to mention one. There's a band that is reuniting for a world tour, and I was asked to go to this particular concert. And I got to be honest, I said no because I don't have any interest, and I think I like one song by the band. They are not a metal band, but any thoughts on this Blink-182 reunion? I, I was shocked at how many metalheads were like flipping over themselves, looking forward to, to this band getting back together. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm, I enjoy what I know, but what I know is, is minimal. You know, it's like the, 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 the hits. I, I never, um, I never had any of their albums, so I don't really know like any of the full albums, um, so I, I it, you know, I think the band has been existing all this time. It's just a matter of this is going to be the original lineup or the most well-known lineup. But sure, I know sure. Travis Barker has been kind of like in and out of the band over the years. And um, so it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I don't know that I, I don't know that I would care enough to go see them live, but, um, and I did see that, um, they're they're doing another when when we were young festival. Um, I don't know if we ever talked about it on the podcast, but um, the, it was just kind of this um, giant festival of the '90s and early 2000s alt rock bands, and, and this this next one has Blink 182, presumably the reunited lineup, and Green Day. Uh, headlining which I think is interesting and there's just a lot of like the offsprings on there there's a lot of like cool bands especially it's it's a little bit um I'm like a little bit older than I think the intended crowd because there's some of those bands that were like the early 2000s kind of emo rock movement um that yeah it was that, like five to seven years ahead or behind depending on how you look at it I think our taste in other words, if it was 1993 or 1994, it would be one thing. But a lot of these bands were kind of popular at the turn of the century, I think. Yes, I I agree. Um, you know, because you have like your you have your good Charlottes and your your yellow cards and your simple plans, and so like that kind of is that that reminds me of kind of the time like after I finished college. Um, you know, the I, I uh, newfound glories on here uh, lit. A bowling for soup, less yeah. than Jake, um, yellow card, thrice, 
uh, you know, Rise Against, 30 Seconds to Mars. I mean, there's some, there's some interesting stuff on here. Uh, good Charlotte, but, um, I, I need like, uh, I need a festival with like Collective Soul, Candle Box, Gin Blossoms, you know, uh, that, a little bit more of that, uh, that era. So maybe like the, when we were young, minus 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> when when so, we were even younger festival. Like, yeah. then, then I think we're on to something. Yeah. This is, I think this is aiming at, at probably people that are about five to 10 years younger than we are. But, um, yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it's got a hell of a lot more bands on it than like some of these like, um, indie rock festivals where I, it's like, they'll get like, um, uh, like one band that I've heard of to headline. And then it's just like a giant poster of bands I've never heard of. Like, um, like God suitcase and, and, uh, what, what was the pineapple kumquats, as you mentioned earlier, um, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic band if you've never heard them um yeah it, it's interesting i don't know that i would ever go see the show i i already passed on tickets for for blink but um good for them and uh, i'm sure they'll make a lot of money because they're playing uh a ton of shows the u.s or north american tour kicks off may 4th in st paul minnesota yeah uh, they're going until about july mid-july where they end in nashville and then they've got european dates latin american dates so they'll 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 be busy next year for sure Definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we get to your pick for next week, any, uh, any random news items you want to throw out there? Yeah. Um, I don't know if uh, that, the, our, our, our debut of, uh, of, um, what is it? Metal, metal news, uh, the metal news roundup. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to top that top last week's for weirdness of, of all the <laughs> stuff that, came through but uh, I'll, I'll shoot a couple of headlines your way uh and you can um you can you can kind of uh just say, say what you will uh um blackie lawless says that fans made the first wasp u.s tour in a decade of reality uh the promoters didn't think this band could sell tickets i'm still not convinced that i'm seeing them next month I have seen so many wasp shows come and go and be announced and then get canceled for any number of reasons, I have no idea what to expect, but I will say this. I am excited to see this band next month. If they actually do show up and play, um, I have a soft spot for them. And from what I understand by all accounts, they were just one of those bands that you had to see live in the eighties. I don't expect it to be the same show as 1984, but at the same time, I'm really excited to see them because there's something about their sound that I like. So yeah, that, cheers. that's one of those bands. That's one of those bands that I'm woefully, uh, just not aware of, I, I know one song and it's an Elton John cover. So, which is a fantastic <laughs> cover by the way, but uh, we're going to have to remedy that. I think. Yeah. For without a doubt. Um, uh, we, you know, we talked about that. We we're uh, going to be seeing Iron Maiden uh, next week. Well, um, in Anaheim, uh, Bruce Dickinson physically removed a fan from the stage. Uh, the good news is you'll be so far away that you don't have to worry about that being you. We are sitting not close, but it'll be a fun show nonetheless, and uh, more power to Bruce. I'm surprised he didn't get, hit him with the uh, with the uh, British flag. Yeah, and to be fair, if I was going to jump the stage, I'm going right for Steve Harris. So <laughs> I love it. Uh, let's see. Um, we uh, well here. This one's interesting. Um, just uh, with um, you know, Chris Cornell passed away few years ago um and and these kind of these youtube stats are always so fascinating to me i, I recently um when coolio passed away we I, I saw that like um gangsta's paradise had i want to say it had over 1 billion views on on youtube or something like that um yeah and I, you know what i just i just want to fact check i feel like i'm doing a lot of fact checking myself uh but you know i don't want to you know i don't want to say things that are inaccurate um especially when it comes to coolio and gangster's paradise you got to be yeah well i'm not gonna i'm not gonna i'm not gonna you know misquote this guy uh you know while he's um you know from the grave uh (laughs) i don't know all right so there's one there's a number of them but um the it looks like the one from coolio's youtube account has 29 million views so we'll use that as a uh, as a measuring stick audio slaves like a stone video has just surpassed 1 billion views on youtube so uh that's insane that's, 
that's an impressive statistic, especially for um, just like you're a, kind of an alt an alt slash hard rock band from you know the early two thousands, where uh, you know talk about um, you know when we were young, it was kind of like a at least a time for me where like radio rock was not at at its strongest suit, and I remember Audio Slave being kind of a, a bright shining light in a time of darkness. Uh, you know, I think it was, um, it's kind of a, 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 the, the guys from, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, rage against the machine kind of coming together with Chris Cornell from Soundgarden. So having Tom Morello and Chris Cornell together was kind of like, a you know, a, a, almost an all-star pairing, right? Right from the get go. I don't know a ton of songs, but the ones that I know that were all like radio hits were all really good tunes. And, and like a stone was definitely one of them. Yeah. And you talk about, you know, radio friendly bands or, you know, the, the kind of the slow demise of radio rock, at least you had an audio slave 20 years ago. Now there's nothing like literally nothing. I don't even know where you would find new rock music on the radio. Yeah. You got me. I, I, I still, I listen to, uh, if I do listen to the radio, I listen to satellite radio and it's all like, you know, I, my favorite station right now is uh, is cl- Classic Rewind, which is all like the 70s and 80s cassette era of classic rock. So it's like, you know, your journeys and your foreigners. And, and like, I love that that era. It just, uh, there's so much good stuff. Like Tom Petty, like I, I that's my my favorite era of classic rock for sure. Um, not, not to go on a rant about satellite radio, but when you have... Every album at your disposal. I don't understand why certain stations uh, and, and Hair Nation is is the, maybe the biggest culprit of this. They play the same twenty songs over and over again, and like you have all these bands with like these rich discographies. Go deeper, find different bands. Don't play the same hit over and over again. It makes no sense to me. It's not. It's not like you're paying for the advertisements. I don't get it. I really, I, that, that was my gripe. I had it for a while and I got, just got sick of hearing the same things over and over again, knowing how much other material was out there. Well, not only that, but there's a ton of new bands that really like could use a, a light shine on them. I mean, not even new bands talk about Dragonland. Like these, some of these songs that we talked about today it would be phenomenal to get those onto, uh, one of those uh, metal stations that, that are on satellite radio and get that sound out. And I know like, you know, some of the co- more core bands, like, like an Amaranth, you, you will actually get catch a, an Amaranth tune on, on satellite radio or, or like a within temptation or a night wish. But like, you know, there's so much we there's, I was saying to you before, there's, there's like a, a laundry list of bands that I've never even heard of. So just, just think about how much obscure, uh, you know, metal is out there that that could be that that was why i wanted to do a radio show when i was in college and i'm telling you one of these days i'm going to get one of those cassettes uh transferred and we're going to post it as like a bonus episode i I think that's a great Um, idea i love it but um that was why i wanted to do it so bad because you know i I wanted like where were you going to hear stradivarius and gamma ray on the radio like uh, a college station or or europe (laughs) <laughs> so, or, or, or a college station in Europe as the case may be. Yeah. But so. um I love it. And 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 I think that's a, a nice segue. What are we doing next week? Because I think we have an anniversary to celebrate. Yes. Uh well, as um if you've been around long enough to notice, uh <laughs> our first uh our very first episode um was dropped uh almost to the day uh, in October of 2020. And um, I, I, we had, I, 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 I want to say that you gave me the, the first choice uh, on that first episode. And we had, and we went with um, Fate's Warnings Inside Out, which I'm sure you were kind of surprised that I would go with a, a, a prog album to kind of kick shocked. things off. I was shocked. I, I thought for sure it was going to be like Freedom Call or something like that, but alas, yeah. here we are. And I thought it was—I thought it was a fun way to start the show. Yeah, and, and then a year ago, uh, when we were celebrating, you know, one year, I thought it would be kind of, uh, you know, a, a cool thing to to circle back to Fate's Warning because we hadn't speaking speaking spoken about them in, in long form since that first episode, and we talked about their parallels album. So I'm sure, you know, it doesn't take a, uh, it doesn't take a genius to see where we're headed with this. Um, 
I, I, I thought it would be fun for our our third uh, our, our third uh, is it our second anniversary third anniversary uh, I'll have to ask I think it's the Pat. second anniversary <laughs> all right I'll have to ask Pat and Ralph to do the math for me but um, <laughs> yes it's our uh, no it's our second anniversary um, the beginning of our our third year um, and I'm going to uh, to to what I considered the the uh, the '90s trilogy of um, Fate's Warning albums. Uh, we'll fi- we'll finish the trilogy with uh, 1997's "A Pleasant Shade of Grey," an album that I really don't know nearly as well as I should. And I know that you're a big fan, so um, it, it, this is definitely going to be a uh, this is going to be one of the rare times I pick an album where I'm actually going to be uh, needing to do some listening and learning. Um, but uh, I think I think that. Um, we might just do Fate's Warning albums on the third week of October every year until we run out of Fate's Warning albums to cover. Well, which, fortunately, I think we have a another, while. I think we have another decade or so before we run out. Um, this is a great choice, and uh, ironically, celebrated celebrated its twenty fifth anniversary earlier this year. So, kind of fitting in that regard as well. Um, this this is a masterpiece in a number of different ways, but not the most accessible album. So, I'm, I'm curious to see if. With repeated listens, it kind of clicks for you a little bit more than maybe it has in the past. Yeah, well, I, it, you know, I, I had mentioned in passing that, like, you know, I had a hard time getting into like the um, the astonishing my dream theater just because of the sheer. wasn't that I wasn't enjoying it when I was listening to, it, but just the sheer length of it. Um, I just couldn't. Um, it, it almost like it's almost as if like I was overwhelmed by the length, and, and I think that like. A Pleasant Shade of Grey was like that for me for my whole, as long as it's been out. I mean, I I bought the CD when it came out, and I I still don't really know the album mm. that well. Um, because, I mean, for those who don't know, it's a 52, 53-minute song that's broken up into, uh, I think, 13 or 14 parts. Um, or 12, but that's it's it's good. It's good. Yeah, well, it's a lot of parts. Um, so I'm going to try to wrap my head around this for the first time since it was released, and uh, and hopefully I will see what everybody else sees. Um, but uh, I li- I've, I've listened to it like once in the last week, and, and even then I was like, man, talk about dense. If you, I, I, Dragonland's got nothing on uh, on these guys for density. This is, this is a dense album, and it's very different from the two albums that we spoke about uh, previously. I'll I'll say this. I know the album very well, but I know it as one long song. So what's going to be interesting for me is listening to it as separate tracks. Not that I'm not going to play the whole thing all the way through. Obviously I, I am and I will, but it's breaking down each part of the song into its individual components it's kind of listening to it in a whole new light for me because I just always appreciated it as one longer piece of music. So it, it, uh, great choice. I look forward to it. I have something fun planned for the uh, final episode of the month. And then we have a nice request lined up for uh, the first week of November. So the next, the next three weeks have kind of been charted out for us. And then I'll, uh, I'm sure we'll pick something fun for for the middle of November when we when we kind of get back into our groove again. But uh, appreciate everyone listening. Leave us a positive review on the uh, podcast or on the YouTube channel so other people can find us. We would appreciate that, and uh, we look forward to coming next week as we celebrate uh, our anniversary. Yes, and uh, and uh, hang tight. Um, I'm hoping that, barring any issues, we should before Fate's Warning, we should have a interview with. Um, Jonas Heidgert of Dragonland and and you know what my marble mouthed uh, explanation of this album hopefully he'll make up for it by actually giving us some uh, first hand insight on the recording and and uh, and then hopefully it won't devolve into a discussion about uh, hockey video games or just hockey <laughs> and or video games because um, uh, we we happen to share a lot of uh, other interests with our friend Jonas other than music so um, I, Who I'm knows excited where we'll uh, go. Yeah, I'm excited. Ever since I messaged Jonas to ask him if he w- wanted to do an interview with us, we've kind of become like uh, messaging buddies, and we've talked about pretty much everything but music. So uh, <laughs> it'll be. I-, I think I warned you that this this could be about a five minute discussion about Power of the Night Star and a fifty five minute discussion <laughs> about the uh, the dissertation of, of Henrik Lundqvist and and how he never won a Stanley Cup. 
I, I don't want to talk about that for more more than, longer than I have to. But the, the Rangers are off to a 1-0 start, so th I've got that going for me. Look forward to it. It should be fun. I will talk to you soon, bud. Enjoy the rest of your week. You too, buddy. Take care.